will be going through. I don't know if everyone can see us. So we're looking forward to a lively discussion and, and getting us towards some, some solutions or ideas by the end of the hour, which we're excited about. Jonathan, do you have any other? No, um, no. Um, I think the, the guests can actually uh, see it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So let's jump in. We'll give everybody probably about two more minutes to join us. Um, I know we have a good uh, a good number of registrants who are, are attempting to log on. And so we'll give them to about three or four after and then jump in to our introductions. Thank you for joining us. And just to remind guests is please send us any messages using the question and answer function and we will do our best to make sure everyone's questions are addressed and answered uh, throughout the next hour. It looks like Doug is on as a participant. He just needs to be um, promoted to. Uh, okay, great. Fantastic. I'll give it another minute or so. Dr. Hotez, this has been an interesting COVID week. <laughs> I'm tired of interesting COVID weeks. Yeah, I, want, so I want boring COVID weeks. So. Yeah, so am I. I. I thought I was going to have a good summer. and. I'm at this at this stage. I'm I'm becoming more and more speechless, which Doug and uh, several other can tell you is not the typical <laughs> Jonathan. I'm I'm never very uh, speechless, but what I've seen thus far and uh, well, it's 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 the unforced errors that are it, that yeah are just mind boggling. That's the frustrating part. Can you hear me? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, Welcome, Douglas. <laughs> Nice to see you. What's interesting, Dr. Hotezo, is uh, in New York, as I'm sure we have a lot of people who are hoping for interesting COVID weeks as it might detract from other non-COVID stories that are happening. <laughs> yeah, no, New York is, what they're doing in New York is interesting. We can, we can, we can talk about that, happy to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's jump in. Jonathan, Drake, you guys good to go? Yes. Fantastic. I think we're ready. Um, well, I want to give a huge welcome and hello to everybody. I'm here in Guyana um, in the Caribbean, and we're really excited for you to join us for this Color of COVID conversation, which is hosted by the Path Check Foundation, the Institute for Technology and Global Health in partnership with Food Medicine. Uh, myself, I'm Sienna Lace, and I'm one of the founding members of the PathCheck Foundation last February already, and also part of the founding leadership team of the Institute. Um, I'm a recent graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School, where personally I've been focused on crisis management uh, in the face of disaster, which quickly evolved to COVID last spring. Um, together with Drake Johnson, we have spent the better part of last year really focused on the overall disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color and are really excited to continue the conversation today. Drake? Yeah, it's, it's exciting to, to finally be here um, to speak on such an important topic. So my name is Drake Johnson. I'm a rising senior at Harvard studying government and African-American studies. I joined the Path Check team last year uh, when the pandemic first kicked off and um, worked in some of the government outreach and correspondence efforts early summer and then started working with Tiana on stuff related to equity and justice and COVID response. I want to give a, uh, a huge 
welcome and thank you to uh, our partners for this event. Hood the Hood Medicine Initiative is a nonprofit public health collective made up of scientists, hackers, and other assorted geeks who are dedicated to improving the health of black and brown people in the communities we live in. The Global Co-Creation Lab is a high-tech concentrator answering many of our era's greatest challenges in health and medicine. Another MIT-founded project that began with a collaboration with Miami-Dade County before COVID, and they continue to identify and implement the best ways uh, to utilize digital technology and improving our resilience in this pandemic. The We Got Us Empowerment Project is a Boston-based collective of Black community members, health professional students, and allies dedicated to empowering our communities with education about the medical about medical racism, COVID-19, and the vaccine. Our own new chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated is composed of students from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Harvard College, Tufts University, and Babson College. Representing the legacy of Black community organizing on college campuses, the Ronu chapter provides programming for intellectual enrichment, professional development, and service across the Cambridge community. And our webinar host, PathCheck Foundation and the Global Institute for Health and Technology are nonprofit spinoffs from MIT that are using leading technology to deliver pandemic solutions not provided by the private sector. PathCheck led the charge last year with the work of exposure notification and has continued to work over the past year as our knowledge is expanding about the virus. Today's webinar will consist of a conversation between myself, Sienna, and our moderators on vaccine hesitancy in communities of color. Please, we urge you to use the uh, Q&A function or the chat function uh, to submit any questions and we'll try to incorporate them where we can. Absolutely. Thank you, Drake. Um, and we're really excited. Drake, um, Drake and I have been talking about this for literally about a year, and we've had various webinars and various conversations that some of you that are online have participated in that really started with hesitancy with communities of color as it related to digital contact tracing, which was the first real conversation that we had about a year ago as it related to COVID. And that conversation as COVID has evolved, the conversation obviously has evolved, yet we still have this, this disparity between certain communities um, in the United States, of course, but really it's around the world, which is where, you know, which is why we're really excited to, to dive in with more of a global perspective today. Um, so in addition to Drake and I, you've, you've already heard a little bit from Jonathan White. Um, Jonathan is the co-founder and policy director of Hood Medicine Initiative. Um, and Hood, as Drake described, is a nonprofit public health collective. Um, there are many conversations happening around the country uh, focused in the same way that Hood is focused, but Hood has really stood out to us in the way that they have brought together both community leaders, uh, leaders in the industry, including um, Dr. Hotez, um, to really get a conversation going that transforms into policy and action, which is where we hope our conversation will go today. Um, we are also joined by, as I mentioned, Dr. Peter Hotez, um, who uh, I struggle to, to confine or, or consolidate your bio, but we've described you as American scientist, pediatrician, and advocate in the fields of global health, vaccinology, um, and neglected tropical disease control. Um, he serves as the founding dean of the National School of Trop Tropical Medicine, uh, professor of pediatrics and molecular virology and microbiology at the Baylor College of Medicine and is also the director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center of Vaccine Development. I imagine we'll touch a little bit upon some of the issues that are arising related to school being back in session this fall and children being vaccinated uh, in general. Um, I'm also very excited to be joined by the Honorable E.J. Saunders, who is the Deputy Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, he is currently responsible as the Minister of Health and Human Services, um, which includes managing the Turks and Caicos government response to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where the Deputy Premier for us is a voice that we're so, you know, looking forward to hearing from is the actual challenges facing the person or persons responsible for distributing and ensuring that the public is vaccinated. Um, and I'm excited to hear a little bit more about the success that they've had there um, in terms of encourage, encouraging people to get the vaccine. 
Um, and finally, we are joined by Doug Slaughter, who in addition to being a part of the Hood Medicine team, is also an epidemiologist with the CDC Foundation, um, which is an independent nonprofit. It's a sole entity that was created actually by Congress to mobilize philanthropic and public sector resources to support both the core CDC um, and prevention's critical health protection work. And so um, I think between the, the four of you and hopefully Drake and myself, um, we'll be able to give a really well-rounded perspective in terms of where we are today with COVID, um, vaccine hesitancy uh, versus resistance overall, and what we can be doing to encourage people to get vaccinated. Drake, can I have you? Yeah, um, there's a lot, I think, to unpack in that conversation. And so <laughs> I think a good place to start is, you know, kind of what's going on. I mean, we have the Delta variant uh, and a lot of conversation around that. Uh, Dr. Hotez, can you share a little bit about, you know, what the landscape is and, and the challenges, I think, right now in terms of COVID spread? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the landscape is, I think we, we thought that we wouldn't be having this discussion, uh, that, that we were on a good trajectory back in April, May of vaccinating the country. And we ha all had a lot of optimism that we were going to have a great summer that we potentially could have vaccinated our way out of this uh, epidemic. And but unfortunately, our our, vac our ability to vaccinate, um, because there were good vaccines, it wasn't a problem with the vaccines, they were high performing vaccines, both the mRNA vaccines, the two from Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna and the J&J &J vaccine. The problem was vaccination stalled and they hit a real, a re hit a real thud um, starting into May and June. And now we're in this situation where uh, we have uh, not just out hotspot areas, but large regions of the country that are mostly unvaccinated in terms of young people. So um, one of the big air problem areas is the entire so South, you know, go extending from Texas across the Gulf Coast of Florida, then up into the Carolinas. What we're seeing is the older Americans are doing a little better over, you know, pretty much 80% and over, but then uh, basically none of the adolescents are vaccinated or under 20% and none of the young, young adults. And that's problem number one. It's also true of, the, of the, some of the mountain states like Wyoming and in parts of Utah and Colorado, problem number two. And then, and if we still might've been okay, were it not for the fact that we, this, this, this gap, this uh, inability to vaccinate, allowed a variant to enter into our country from, from the UK, the Delta variant. And this is far more transmissible than anything we've seen before um, with a reproductive number of six to eight, meaning that if a single individual gets it, six to eight others who are unvaccinated will also get it. And now it's, so now this is taking off like a forest fire across the Southern United States uh, in a in a fourth wave, and also in some of the mountain states, but the South is uh, is terrible right now, and especially states like Louisiana and, and Florida, um, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Texas will get hit next. Uh, I would predict, and and it's a lot of young people now are being hospitalized and even going into intensive care units, even pediatric intensive care care units. So we're we're paying a steep price for our inability to vaccinate the South and, and other parts of the country are doing much better. So uh, Vermont, New, Massachusetts, New England states, mid-Atlantic states, uh, that the thing has not really caught on in a big way. There's some uptick, but it's still modest and, and most parts of the, of the West Coast. But right now, the South is, is raging and we're seeing the pediatric intensive care units start to fill up and school hasn't even started. Um, so and that's the other big concern. We're gonna be open to in-person classes and a lot of the governors of the states with the exception of Louisiana are, have sort of hand tied us in terms of our ability to fight this. None of the states have vaccine mandates and most of the Southern states are refusing mask mandates, which are you know the only two, only two weapons 
that we have. So I worry this thing is going to accelerate more. I don't think this Delta variant is necessarily specifically targeting the kids. I just think anyone who's unvaccinated at this point is now getting infected and, and kids are getting swept up uh, in all of this. And so one of the big questions is what do we do about the South? How do we fix that? What do we do about some of the other um, regions of the country where people aren't vaccinated? And because what we're seeing is wherever you have that one, two Delta punch, high Delta, low vaccinations, things really spread uh, rapidly. And and now the kids are starting to get it and we'll get it more as, as schools open. So we're in a very difficult situation right now. And as bad as it is, as schools open, and they open early in the South. So in Houston, um, schools in the Houston Independent School District, they'll open August 23rd. Many uh, parish schools in Louisiana uh, next week, um, some in Mississippi have already opened and actually closed because they couldn't sustain um, the COVID control. So this is, and, and of course the great tragedy, and we'll talk, we'll do a deeper dive in this in this hour is we didn't have to get here. This is all an unforced error. This is our self-inflicted wound, whatever metaphor you want to use. And, and, and that, that's our current situation. And don't even get me started about Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia, because uh, that's, that's yet another humanitarian catastrophe. And, and I'm glad we have representation from the Caribbean. I'd be curious to hear the, the minister's perspective. I know Cuba is terrible right now, but he could probably enlighten us what's going on there as well. Absolutely. Um, and Dr. Hotez, I think that's such an important point. Um, being physically in South America right now is a lot of the common is we don't even talk about the Lambda variant. You know, we have other variants that are occurring around the globe that, that aren't even on our kind of dialogue or, or radar. And so that to me is the most frightening thing. Um, I will segue to uh, Deputy Premier Saunders is I would love to, to have you address the question that Dr. Hotez just uh, asked is what is the landscape right now in Turks and Caicos? Uh, does, does what's happening in the Caribbean match what's happening in the US? How does one inform the other? Uh, first of all, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, what's going on in the Caribbean? The, um, the Turks and Caicos, so far we've been doing, we've been doing fairly well. Um, I think we, we mirrored the United States, not as bad. Um, the issue that we're having is that we're getting the Pfizer vaccine from the UK and they've been sending it uh, on an as needed basis and we've done fairly well. Uh, we're now at our batch and we have 25,000 uh, adults who've been uh, vaccinated. So in terms of percentages, we are looking at about 35,000 adults so out of that. Today, we're about 67% fully vaccinated out of the 35,000 adults and we're at 71% are partially vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our positivity rate right now in terms of the, the virus, we're at 28. And the something happened over the weekend. We sent out eight uh, positive samples to the sequence. They came back with four of them being, uh, uh, being found to have the, the Delta variant of the virus. Uh, one was a tourist and, and three was a community spread. One out of the three was uh, fully vaccinated. One was partially vaccinated. And um, so sort of around July, we early July, we went all the way down to zero positive cases. And we were doing fairly well for about a week. And then it eased up five. We had five positive cases. And I'm tell you two things and, and uh, I'm at the same time. We had five positive cases, but the five were tourists. Uh, tourists mainly from uh, uh, the southern states of the United States. Then that five jumped to 11, 10 out of them were tourists. And then we started seeing community spread. So when we got up to 19, 16 were tourists, and we got as high as 33. And now what we're seeing is that we're adding about two or three every day. Most of them are tourists, um, and that's got us baffled. But as we bring on new, as new cases uh, come on, there we have a few recoveries. So we've been staying pretty steady at low 30. So we think that we're doing actually a pretty good job. But what happened though is that our vaccination rate has slowed down completely. Like we, we, we moved pretty quickly all the way up to about 63, 64%. And then all of a sudden now uh, we're just adding a little bit every week. So in terms of vaccination, we probably added two or 300 in the last week. 
So we've been now at about 67% now for almost two weeks, and we're just not growing anymore in terms of vaccinations. But we've got the vaccines. We've got a lot of vaccine. And, and the, uh, the UK is sending it to us on demand, so if we need it more, they will send it. But we, they, their last set of persons are just not getting vaccinated, and it's causing us a huge problem. Now, what we've done to, to pick it up a little bit is that we made all work permit holders. I mean, if it was in the United States, it would be similar to the green card holders. Uh, and work permit holders in Britain made, made it mandated that they have to get vaccinated or they wouldn't get a renewal. And that got us up from about 62 to 60% to where we are right now. But we're having a difficult time. And now we are in the middle of summertime and everyone wants to get out. Uh, Turks and Caicos is a hot destination, so we have a lot of tourists coming into the country. They're having a lot of parties. So we've actually taken a very f a firm stand against parties, particularly the outdoor beach parties. Over the weekend, we had a lot of fines for persons going way over the, the, the mandated number. We have a cap on 100. You've seen a few parties at around three, four, five hundred. 500. So we had the police out quite a bit trying to shut those down. Now, like I said, now that we've, since the weekend, we found the Delta variant. So we've now gotten, you know, having to zoom in on what's happening. Like I said, particularly with the tourists. This is the first time since I've been minister, and I think the first time since the virus has been around, we are, we've got more tourists positive than we've had uh, people from the residents. Mm -hmm. So that's going to cause us some problems. Uh, we're having cabinet tomorrow, so we're going to be looking at new measures. And, and everything is on the table right now, but we certainly don't want the that Delta variant to get out of hand. But if the doctor, I'm certainly, I can, I'm looking at him on the screen, I can certainly, this would be surprising to him, or probably not surprising, mm -hmm. that out of eight positive samples we sent out for sequencing, four of them came back with the Delta variant. So you know what that says about what's in the community. That we are uh, that and that tells me that a large majority of the cases in the community should would, would probably be positive, or at least it's growing, it's going in that direction. It's if fifty percent of the positive cases came back with the Delta variant. So uh, so we're going to be we are focusing on that. We're trying to proactively manage it, but um, we've done a pretty good job because a lot of our neighbors, uh, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, the Bahamas, those are seeing cases grow very very rapidly. And so that's why I said we've done a pretty good job, but I expect that we're going to start to see case rises, uh, cases increase because the Delta variant is now in, in, in country. Yeah, I think you you mentioned a very interesting and important point, right? Is that the with the vaccine early on it shot up in terms of people getting vaccinated, and it was a much faster process, and now we're seeing the. Um, I think you know not only in in the Caribbean but also in the United States the, the slowing of of the rate in which people are getting vaccinated. Uh, I'm not sure, Doug, if you can share any more about kind of, you know, from the CDC's perspective, both um, how a lot of those things like the mass mandate and vaccine uh, provisions came to come to be, uh, as well as anything you can share about the vaccine vaccination rate in the US. Sure, so, uh, so just to be clear, so I can't speak on behalf of the CDC or the CDC foundation. Um, but I, you know, so, but you do see that same tapering off um, that, uh, you know, the Honorable Jay Sanders just mentioned in, in the in the Caribbean, you know, uh, the, you know, the first half of uh, the, of the U.S. lined up to, to get the vaccine. And then um, it was a, a, a slow crawl to that, that 70% metric that we just re recently hit um and and you, you it's the distribution of that is a little bit different right it's uh that number is higher in new england um and out west compared to in the south and in certain parts of the mid midwest and it's also different depending on what you know what age group you're in right uh, it's the the younger the younger individuals are have a vaccination rate and proportion that's much less than you know the the older population um, and you also see a disparity in that regard by race and I, I was just looking today and even though um, it's we've been getting better we're we're still pretty far off. The mark, I would say, um, I, I, this the the CDC has uh, a COVID data tracker that's available to anybody that wants to to look and see 
uh, what's going on in the, in the U.S. And you, there's a there's a metric that shows you the percent of people receiving the the COVID vaccine by race and ethnicity, and and it's it's a it's a pretty there's a pretty stark difference. You know, if you if you look at um, Asian non Hispanic uh, populations there. The, their percentage of fully vaccinated individuals is about 37.1%. Um, uh, American Indian and Alaska Native, they're about at 41.2%. Um, Black and Latinos at 31.2%. Uh, white non-Hispanics at 33.5%. And the Black non-Hispanic population is sitting at 25%. And, um, and believe it or not, that's better than where we were. Uh, it's, but that slow crawl is is really leaving us exposed to things like the Delta variant, which is taking hold and you know threatens a lot in terms of um, being able to fight COVID. So, thank you, Doug. No, I think that's fascinating, and it's. Um... There's stats that people don't really understand. We talk about them, but don't really understand the, the differentiation, I think, between the numbers as a society as a whole. Um, and when I think of that, Jonathan, I know this really was at the heart of founding Hood Medicine. Um, this, this idea of, I, I call it have and have nots, but that have and have nots in this case is really two Americas, right? And it's really two, two echelons of society, no matter where you are, which is one is vaccinated and the other is unvaccinated. Can you talk a little bit more about that from your perspective as a, as a founder of Hood Medicine? Yeah, you know, interestingly enough, uh, we had this conversation recently. Um, I tend to think we're divided into three Americas um, and, and it's important to really distinguish. Uh, obviously we have the vaccinated population uh, but there's two cohorts of unvaccinated, and we have to look at them differently and treat them differently. There are the uh, unvaccinated and hesitant, and in that group, you'll find a lot of black and brown um, families, members of those communities, uh, those folks who have some reasonable distrust of uh, government and of medical establishments, um, you know, dating back to, you know, forced sterilizations and Tuskegee study. Um, among many other you know, violations of them um, by government and by the medical community. Um, and then you have the unvaccinated and resistant um, population. And that population, I believe, and I think Dr. Hotez can uh, attest to this, is led primarily by political ideology and a, an aversion to scientific fact. Um, the sad part now, I believe, um, is we've, for the last several months, I think, uh, there's been this hard turn focus to get conservatives vaccinated, to get conservatives to believe in vaccinating to save themselves. Um, and I think that took a shift off of other communities who are vulnerable and need to have proper messaging going to them. Uh, you know, um, you, we, we can't approach those two communities the same. Uh, one of those communities is just not uh, making their decisions based on fact, science, logic, um, nothing at all. I've had plenty of conversations and arguments and debates with folks. Um, I had a conversation with somebody today who told me we can't figure out what variant somebody has because we can't test for variants. And I told them I spent several years of my career doing DNA sequencing. So I know we can sequence uh, DNA samples and figure out which variant uh, people uh, people have. Um, those people just don't believe in science. They don't believe in fact. They believe in whoever their political leaders are and what those political leaders say. And until those political leaders decide that they want to make a shift to protect all of this country and uh, our global community, those people aren't going to make any changes. The people we need to really focus on right now are the folks in those vulnerable communities uh, the black and brown communities, the poor communities, uh, some who don't have access to the vaccine, and some people who just have a reasonable distrust of a government. Uh, we need to talk to them in, a, in uh, terms that they understand. We need to address their concerns, um, you know, full throatedly. We need, you know, as a, you know, as a nation, we need to apologize to those communities for what we've done uh, to them over the years. 
Um, and, and I want to be very clear, this isn't just about, you know, going back to Tuskegee and uh, some of the other, you know, medical mishaps that we've had. Um, oftentimes today, you'll find black and brown people who don't get good quality care from their physicians, uh, people who go into the doctor's office and don't come out with the best outcomes. Um, so if we're not addressing those issues full on and talking about them in a very honest way, we're not going to be able to tackle that second group of unvaccinated people. Absolutely, that's a great point. Uh, I spent personally the last uh, year essentially in the Bahamas and it was interesting to see uh, what a strong factor that myth, I call it urban legend, played a part into people's opinions towards the vaccine, towards the virus, et cetera. Um, I feel like governments, whether we're looking at a state, a city, a county, a, a, a nation, have had a really hard time in terms of giving us good information that's accurate because a lot of us are learning as we go along. Um, in contrast, and I, I go to you again, Deputy Premier, is on the government website for Turks and Caicos, you actually have a myth busters section, uh, which I love. And how effective has that been in helping to dispel some of the myths that are out there? And I'd love to hear your personal opinion on some of the most outlandish concerns that people have with respect to the virus and vaccines. Um, well, the the issue that we're having is that the um, the Mythbuster uh, section actually helped us in the beginning when we when it was mm -hmm. more medical. We had persons who were saying that uh, they didn't that they still want to have kids and they were um, hesitant because they think it was going to affect them in terms of the fertility, the ability to to have kids in the future. So that Mythbuster section worked well for that, uh, but it doesn't work very well for the those who have religious hesitancy who actually believe that it's the mark of the beast. And, and so we are running into that now. So we have a whole section that if they do it, it's going, something's going to happen to them. Uh, and they're not going to go to heaven. And then we've got the, the, the young, uh, there's a certain group of young uh, folks who just don't want to do it. I think they think that they're invincible and that they don't need it. And, and we have a bit of a group that believes that, um, the only thing I can call it is, uh, Bush medicine, but basically uh, natural herbs and remedies that they, they can use in order to to strengthen the immune system. But the, the myth buster worked, like I said, it worked well in the beginning, but now what we are running into is persons who, who it's going to take a lot more than putting the myth uh, busters up on the web page to try and address their concerns. We're gonna almost have to pull them across the, uh, across the finish line. Because like I said, particularly those with the religious concerns, they, they're, they're, not, they're not going to move. I, I, I met in person, with some uh, pastors from the uh, Christian community and, and, and they're, they're dug in. And there's nothing that you could get to change their mind about it. They truly believe that it's going against the, uh, the Christian doctrine uh, of what we, we invest. Yeah, I think that's uh, it's interesting in terms of the messaging and in, in the way that's changed over the, the course of the pandemic. Um, and I'm curious, you know, Dr. Hotez, you might be able to speak to this, but, you know, in your work with vaccine hesitancy and resistance and advocacy around it, is the hesitancy now, you know, a, a normal thing in, in relation to other um, vaccine concerns historically, or is it different in this circumstance? Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 changed and it's evolved. And of course, as you as you point out, the anti-vaccine groups don't speak with one voice. I think, you know, in terms of the conservative groups, this is a relatively new trend. You know, the modern anti-vaccine movement started around fake links between vaccines and autism with a paper that was published in The Lancet. Uh, the British Medical Journal in 1998 claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused autism uh, and at that time it was called pervasive developmental disorder. And that paper was debunked because of work from people like our group and others that put a lot of time and effort into it. And what happened was the anti-vaccine movement was losing steam. And so by 2015, they did a pivot. They took a political pivot to the far right and it happened here in Texas when they linked themselves to the Republican Tea Party around this banner of health freedom or medical freedom. And that's when it took that spin to conservatism. And at that time it was far right wing extremism. But 
you know, the far right wing donors started supporting political action committees that were that that were primarily focused on an anti vaccine platform, again, under health freedom, medical freedom. And then this really accelerated in 2020 when those same health freedom anti vaccine groups also protested masks and social distancing. So it became a full on anti science uh, activity. So one thread is um, the political right. And that's what we're seeing play out, I think, a lot in the South and the Mountain West, where now being against vaccines has become part of your tribal allegiance to the GOP, to the Republican Party, which is, you know, relatively new. It never used to be this way, and it's but it's causing a lot of damage. And you're seeing this play out at the CPAC conference where Member, you know, elected members of Congress are saying that um, first they're going to force vaccines. Again, this health freedom, medical freedom concept. Then they're going to take our guns and Bibles. As ridiculous as that sounds, that's uh, there are a lot of people who accepted that, and then uh, and then it was saying that vaccines are nothing more than a coercive measure to gain power by the Democratic Party and. And people believe that too. So that's a big thread going on in the South right now, accounting for vaccine hesitancy, particularly in resistance, particularly among young people and in the Mountain West states. But you also pointed out a, a second group, which is pretty high vaccine resistance in the BIPOC community. And, you know, I'd, I'd be curious from your perspective, because that's also new, I think, from a, for a different reason. You know, when I think of BIPOC communities, I don't ordinarily think of of those groups as in the past as resi resisting childhood vaccinations. I mean, when you looked at CDC data vaccinations by race or ethnicity, you just didn't see those groups necessarily being up there. Yes, in some places where access was an issue, especially for the HPV vaccine, it was a problem. So this you know, these, the statements, distrust in government, yeah, I'm sure it's always there, but in the past, it hasn't really translated into declines in vaccination rates, but for some reason, it has now because of COVID vaccines, and, and I don't think we fully understand that. I think part of it is a different type of targeting, so in the, you know, for the conservative groups, it's the anti-vaccine rants on the cable news networks like Fox News and 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 it's the and terrible behavior by elected members of the United States Congress coming from the political right. I think in terms of vaccine hesitancy in the African American community that's relatively new. I think it's it's deliberate targeting by some of these non-governmental organizations and and we've spoken before about this horrible sort of phony documentary that's out there that shows uh, pictures of African-American groups getting the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and then it switches to grainy and black and white images from the 40s and 50s of Tuskegee experimentation and trying to draw a parallel. So I think that has drawn a damage, done, done a lot of damage. I th and then the question becomes, um, which is the bigger problem? I know they're both problems, but is there one that's dominant? So here are the numbers. We, we have to vaccinate about 85% of the US population in order to halt the Delta the variant. It's a huge bar because the more transmissible a, a virus is, the, the higher the bar for vaccinating. So, you know, the, and the informal number we use is one minus one over the, the reproductive number of the virus, which gets to about 85% of the population. So far, we have vaccinated about 55% of the US population. So that leaves, what, another 30% roughly that we have to vaccinate. So that's a lot of people, right? That's 100 million people. And it looks like a lot of them are in the South, uh, especially. And the question is, of those 100 million, what's the balance? Because you're right, how you manage getting them to overcome vaccine hesitancy and resistance, a very different dynamic if we're talking about conservative groups and people tying their allegiance to far right wing extremism versus hesitancy in, in BIPOC and African American communities. So for instance, right now the Gulf states are the worst. Um, and 
what do the Gulf states have? The Gulf states have some of the highest percentages of conservative groups in, in the United States, right? Guess what? They also have some of the highest percentages of, of people of color in the United States. So is it, is it this combination? And, you, and, and the reason you need to know it is because you need to know what you're dealing with if you're going to solve the vaccine hesitancy resistant issue. And, and I don't think we really fully understand that. We know both groups are at risk. We know both groups are high density in, in, in the Gulf Coast states, in Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, going into Northern Florida. But I don't think we really have, have a sense for that. And, and I think knowing that is going to be really important to, to solve it. And, and, you know, we don't have a lot of time because schools are opening. And, and as I say, opening a school is going to be a big accelerant right now. I just want to add one thing um, to what Dr. Holtes said. Um, there's about 75 million children in the United States from, from age, from newborn to uh, 17 years old. Uh, that's about 20% of the U.S. population, a little over 20% of the U.S. population. If we can vaccinate the, the large majority of those children, uh, and, and we know we, we won't be able to do that until at the very least sometime at the end of this year or early next year, uh, if Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines get uh, emergency use, au use authorization uh, for uh, children under um, 12 years old. Uh, but if we can vaccinate a large majority of that population, that will get us closer to that 85%. Um, and it's going to be that's necessary. Absolutely, that's yeah. absolutely right. And, and when you look at the numbers, they're kind of interesting. So if you break it down, let's look at north-south. Okay, so um, if you look at the percentage of those over the age of 65 vaccinated, there's not that much of a difference in North and South. So it's, it's a little bit in the South, it's about, you know, the worst performing states in the South have about 80% of those over the age of 65 vaccinated, as opposed to 99% up in New England. So there's difference, but it's not dramatic. The big, where the bottom falls out is among young people. So let me, for example, you have about 15, 16% of adolescents in Louisiana vaccinated if uh, you have over 70% of adolescents vaccinated in the northern states. So basically, that's the difference between none of the adolescents and all of the adolescents. And, and again, how much of that are kids of conservative parents versus BIPOC? I, I don't think we really ha have a, I mean, I have hypotheses, but, but I don't think we really know. And, and that's where things are going to go very badly among those very low, low vaccination rates and in, in, among young people in the southern states. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, Dr. Hotez, you know, you know, you know me, I, we worked, I've worked in the space for about a, a year now. Um, I am a vaccine advocate. I got the vaccine as soon as I could take it. Um, but my 13 uh, year old son just got vaccinated uh, this past Sunday, you know, so as a person of color. Um, with the child, uh, it's still very difficult to make that leap um, to putting your child, you know, I think as a parent in general, we don't want to expose our children to any risk at all. Um, and so understanding that there is a very rare risk um, in, uh, of something happening to your child and an even rarer risk of something severe happening to your child, it's still a risk. And so as a BIPOC parent, um, you know, we still have some hesitation in doing that for our kids. So I wouldn't be surprised if those numbers in the South were also, you know, because of that reason, because we are a little hesitant to um, take that leap with our, with our own children. So then we get to Jonathan and Dr. Hotez, you know, you've each spoken about this wall, I think, that we're, we're hitting up against. And uh, Deputy Premier, you also addressed this in terms of, you know, we've gotten to this, this number, but we're unable to cross the threshold to getting more people vaccinated. And I'm curious to get your perspective, Doug, on this one in particular, um, is, so what do we do? Like, how, how do you think, and of course, this is Doug personally, not the CDC speaking, but how do you think as a country, we've handled the marketing and messaging behind covid to get beyond that wall. And then what's interesting is because we've been playing catch up really since the beginning of the outbreak of the, of the virus is what are we doing to address what Jonathan and Dr. Hotez have just described? So how are we addressing fear for children specifically in these communities that are most at risk? Do you feel like we're doing, making any progress in that, in that sense? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a really 
tough question. Um, <laughs> I, what do we do? I'm not sure, uh, to be honest. I think that, I think the past year and a half um, has been uh, a masterclass on <laughs> how nothing is just uh, science or just human behavior or just communication or just politics and how um, all of these things can come together to create a, um, something very challenging, a wildfire that's, that spreads pretty easily. Um, I think I think we there. There's been some hard learned lessons in some places, um, and some areas in which I think those lessons weren't really learned. And I'll give I'll give an example. Um, you know, Dr. Dr. Hotez and Jonathan just spoke about um, you know the, this back to school transition <clears throat> being an accelerant. Well, uh, you know it, it it doesn't need to be. Right. The, the, over the last year, we learned that uh, there are things that can be put in place, like masking and distancing, and um, you know, do, doing hybrid learning and um, you know, cohorting, uh, all these different approaches that uh, al allowed uh, schooling and kids in school not to not be a significant contributor to community spread. Right, and but if you look at how we're approaching things now, um, you see a lot of educators with their hands tied because they're not able to put implement those lessons learned, right? Whether, due to things that are beyond their control, and that and that's unfortunate. That that says that you know at at the intersection of all those aforementioned um uh forces you you know you don't get the best of each one right you you can you can just as easily end up in a situation where you you know some good things to do and to implement and you still feel like your hands are are tied and you can end up, end up taking backward steps so uh i think you know, we've learned things, and then there are things we still haven't we haven't been able to 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 deal with, and and I think misinformation is another thing that contributes to um, you know the spread of of um, you know hesitancy and and resistance and makes things more difficult. That also rest at the center of all those forces that I that I, pr I previously mentioned. So uh, the short answer to your question is, I'm not sure what we do. I think the, the things that we know to do, we aren't doing to the degree that we should. And so, you know, you, you have to get the fundamentals down before you can do anything else. And we seem to struggle with that, unfortunately. And, and you know, I think the stakes are pretty high because now that not getting vaccinated is a thing among cons young conservative groups and not getting vaccinated is a thing among BIPOC communities. What happens after COVID? I I'm worried that there could be spillover to other vaccines. For instance, we've seen a pretty big drop off in HPV vaccination for cervical cancer and other cancer for adolescents. What happens? Is that going to bounce back or is, is this now some permanent injury to the vaccine system. What happens to childhood vaccinations, MMR vaccines? I know they went way down because of the social disruption from COVID-19 and they're slowly coming back, but I worry do they plateau prematurely because of now that vaccine hesitancy has now become or refusals become more established in, in these communities. So we may be paying the price for this for several years to come. Absolutely. And we're already at uh, 10 till the hour, and I would love to turn back to, to you, Deputy Premier, and talk a little bit about successes and lessons that we've learned so far. And one of the things that I've observed 
And the Caribbean is this idea with vaccinations of, of providing incentives, we'll call it. Um, you know, lockdowns tended to be a little bit more severe on a lot of the island communities. Um, and people were very motivated to do what they needed to do in order to get back out into society, for the economies to recover, et cetera. And so I'd be curious to see as a small country, I'm sure there's a lot we can learn as a, as a much larger country in the United States. And I'd love for you to share a little bit um, about that is, is what can we learn from Turks and Caicos? Well, the Turks and Caicos has a uh, small population. And so the, because of the small population, you know everyone. And so it's, um, we can do things that you probably can't do in, in North America because we, we know where the pockets of resistance are. So we can go, for instance, the, the island that I uh, grew up on as, at, at its best, maybe 1,200 people. And so we can look at it and say, okay, we've done three or 400 vaccinations in that town. And, and then we know pretty well who, who's, who are the holdouts. And so you can focus on those persons and zoom in on them very quickly and, and get it up. Um, and so that's been successful in terms of targeting the, the groups that are being holding at all. I don't want to say hold out yet because they, we, we had the groups who were lining up at first and then we have those who are a little bit concerned and can zoom in and, and do the, the things that I'm saying right now. And then all of a sudden you had a wall. And, and so what we started to do is that we started doing community vaccinations, uh, like mobile vaccination clinics, setting up those things. Um, and, and it's something, I'm just going to segue and say it's an idea that we did when I was in the telecommunications industry on how to sell phones when you're selling them under tents. Well, we're doing the same thing with vaccination, having mobile vaccination clinics, and, and that, that did very well. But now, like I said, we've got up to that wall. We have a lot of, we have an immigrant, a lot of immigrants into the country from the region, uh, particularly from Hispaniola, the DR, and in Haiti. And so we are finding a lot of resistance, particularly in, in those communities, particularly in the Haitian communities. And, and then, like I said, the young people. But to answer your question specifically, I would say that the, um, the community work that we did, getting people out into the community, going into to the houses, going to the people that we knew that uh, was, it was being difficult to come out to bring them across and targeting them, having messages that are targeting those specific groups. Like did that work well, but I don't want to say it certainly it's not, has not been a home run because we, like I said, we've been stagnant at 66% for a few weeks. So now I think we've run the course of those messaging and all of the things that we've tried in the past. So now I guess it's time for us to go back to the, the drawing board and see what we can try. But but what worked for us in the, uh, before was certainly the community initiatives that we were doing. Thank you. Um, I, I definitely want to get this one student question in the chat that uh, I'm hoping we can tag really quickly before we start to close up. Dr. Hotez, um, Sterling Bland asked, I'm curious as a student from Colorado, what do you predict will happen with COVID transmission in the Mountain West? Uh, what is your advice in taking a, uh, in talking to hesitant family members who might fear the vaccine could be harmful uh, to their black children as well? Well, the way it worked in last year was we saw a big surge over the summer that began a couple of weeks after the July 4th holiday. And that happened this year as well in the South. And then the other thing that happened was as we headed into the fall, then you saw a big surge in the Great Plains and the Mountain West states. So I think, you know, if, you know, Mother Nature usually tells us what she has in mind. And I think that's where I'm going to really worry, you know, as we, you know, get out of the summer into the fall into September, then you may really start to see those numbers climb up in up in Colorado and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, you never know, it's a new pathogen, but but I think that's a likely scenario. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan and, and Doug, I want to, you know, while we don't necessarily know what, uh, you know, what the answer is to the problem, I think we're able to kind of look to bright spots and successes that we've seen in our work uh, to hopefully have some sort of uh, example to emulate or, or learn from. And so I'm curious in your work, Jonathan uh, and, and Doug, where you've seen success in terms of getting past those, uh, that hesitancy or, or that uh, marketing point where you see success in getting people to uh, engage more with vaccine? To be quite honest with you, I think um, this may be a little controversial. I don't necessarily see, believe we've seen true success yet. I think what we've seen thus far is what we should have expected 
um, when we're in a global pandemic and a vaccine is available. Success to me will be when we start to engage and get into those communities that are hesitant and res re are resistant and to get those folks um, vaccinated. Um, obviously the rollout was a success. I think the way this, many of the states have handled it was a success. But as far as getting the country vaccinated, I think this wall that we, we've hit is a wall, wall that we should have expected. Um, my thing is I think we've had so many missteps and I think Dr. Hotez mentioned this earlier um, that we've had in this process and so many hiccups that could have, um, if they were avoided, put us in a better position than we are right now. Um, you know, one of them is, you know, I, I respect the CDC um, and I believe and trust that everything that they give to us is based on science and data. Uh, the CDC's role is only to look at the science and data and give us guidance based on it. It's then that the job of the politicians and elected officials to take that information and make policy based on it. And I think what pol politicians did was kick, uh, kick the bucket um, and uh, leave the onus on the CDC to provide policy for the entire country. And what I mean by this is when the CDC came out and said that uh, it is now safe for vaccinated people to no, long, no longer wear masks, uh, instead of politicians in various states saying, well, that's great guidance, we believe in those facts, but we know how people are acting in our states, we know how, you know, what we know what we see um, day to day in our states, and because of what we see, we think it's advisable for us to keep mask mandates, you know, uh, running. Um, their goal was instead to get back to normal as soon as possible. And because that was their goal, they, they manipulated the facts to meet that goal rather than looking at what was actually going on. I think we all knew that viruses mutate. We all knew that when viruses mutate, oftentimes they become um, more transmissible and more dangerous. Uh, I think we all knew that um, masks did a great job at mitigate, mitigating the transmission of, of the virus. Um, I think we all knew that crowd control uh, did a great job at, at mitigating the virus and being socially distant. Um, all these things are things that we knew. And when you took started taking those things away um, and focused on getting back to normalcy rather than continuing or focusing on a mitigation strategy, that's when we started losing. And that's why we are where we are today. Um, and we can't continue to make that misstep. So, you know, I'm in the state of New Jersey. I've been harassing my governor on Twitter uh, several times a week to reinstate the mask mandate. Um, we have to, we have to have a national mask mandate because if people uh, vaccinated or not are walking around without masks, uh, if they have the Delta variant, we know that transmission trans transmission is is much higher than it was before with the original strain or with the alpha uh, alpha strain. Um, so we have to mask up so we can continue to pr protect people, particularly our five to twelve year old kids who uh, aren't able to get vaccinated right now. Uh, so we have a lot of mistakes that we've made that we need to learn from, and if we don't learn from them and and you know, hit the ground running heading into the fall, I think, as Dr. Hotez mentioned earlier, we're in for, you know, a bit of a shell shock. Once again. Absolutely. And, and Doug, I'll come to you just in a second. And just so everyone knows, we're getting close to to the end of our talk. But I'd love to know just to bring it together and, and Doug, your perspective with, you know, obviously from the CDC and also from Hood, but also get parting thoughts from Deputy Premier and also Dr. Hotez in, in a solution. Is so how do groups like Hood Medicine, how do they partner with governors or governments and help them to address this idea of vaccine hesitancy? Um, and I wanna go back to and just mention quickly this idea of what you said, Deputy Premier in, in the Turks and Caicos and this idea of really targeting and personalizing messaging. And I, I look to uh, one of the attendees, Quentin Chipley, thank you, who gave some great examples in both Alabama and New Jersey of the personalization of even of, of conservative politicians who have told stories, who have told, you know, tragic tragedies really of what's happened of people that haven't been vaccinated. So how do we how do we bring all those pieces together to really get this last 40, 30%? I think, I think that part of the answer is in building trust and coming from um, 
using a, a culturally competent approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that is what makes hood medicine um, have uh, as much potential as it has in terms of, uh, you know, affecting that kind of change we hope to see. Um, trust is really, really low right now. Uh, if you, you can, you can, you can just see in different conversations that are happening around you or online and in, in online spaces and social media spaces. Um, and you can see that a lot, some, oftentimes the conversation just shuts down once you know where people stand in terms of uh, whether they're, they're in support of, um, whether they're a vaccine advocate or against the vaccine. You know, they, they kind of retreat, to, they can retreat, they tend to retreat to their, you know, their corners rather than, um, you know, meeting in the, in the middle for substantive discussion, right? And I think that coming from a place and building trust um, is, how, is how you get closer to uh, helping people understand each other. I think that's part of it. And, and just a comment on what you, on, on uh, what uh, Dr. Chipley mentioned in the chat also about, uh, you know, uh, Governor Christie and, and other such stories. I think, uh, and I've seen this a lot uh, in the news this week, you know, I think now you're seeing a lot of horror stories of, you know, individuals that, you know, were hesitant, but uh, not averse to getting the vaccine. Uh, their, their hope was just to wait a little bit longer to see uh, what might happen. And unfortunately, um, in, in several of those instances, you know, some, a loved one was lost. And I, I think the reason that's happening is because it's easy to dismiss numbers and statistics and charts and graphs, but it, it hits different when you, you put names and faces in context of these stories of people that um, are being lost to COVID um, and giving that a voice. So I think we have, we have parts of the solution um, and I think it entails those, those two things. And Deputy Premier, what does that look like? So how can a hood medicine or groups like hood medicine help you? <laughs> I'm thinking of you going into a meeting tomorrow and, and how can we help you, you start to communicate the messages that we've talked about? Um, thank you. To, uh, just before I pick up that specific question, I want to say that the um, comment that was made earlier, the, the issue is that as, as government officials, right, and, 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 and I agree with the sentiment that we, we might have dropped the drop the ball because you're, you're not making the best decision when it comes in terms of pure risk and from, um, from a risk mitigation point of view from uh, around COVID. But what happens is that as government officials, you're looking at a bunch of things at the same time, particularly lives and livelihood. And so when you step in, you're also looking at the economy. You're also looking at how can we, we find the right balance. I know that we, we were elected on February 20th. And the first thing that I, I was uh, confronted with as Minister of Health, but also as the Deputy Premier was, what are we going to do for the economy? Because the economy was shut down. And so people were, didn't have no income coming in. And then and, and people were screaming at you saying, I, I need income, I need income. And then the government certainly, while we had some cash on hand that we were able to give a stimulus, we couldn't, we couldn't maintain that for a long period of time. And so then we end up having to look and say, shutting the economy down for two weeks, we know we could get the virus uh, down all the, all the way to zero, but, but can, we, can the economy sustain that? And so that's where you have politicians making those policy decisions that doesn't give you the 100% effectiveness from a risk mitigation point of view, uh, and then sometimes allows the virus to stay in its that's, that's what we are faced with. And, um, and so we, we, the Turks and Caicos, we tried to find the right balance, and, and I think we did, at least for a certain period of time. Now, like I said, we're starting to see the caseload get up and, and hover around about 30, and we're trying to proactively manage in Baghdad, but while also keeping the economy open enough where persons could, could make money. Um, but to answer your specific questions, how can you help us? I mean, it's things like this. I mean, 
this creates the ability to, for us to have this conversation and it creates the contact. Uh, so now, you know, reach out to us because we don't, we don't know all of the groups that are out there. And I'm, and I'm happy that I was invited on this because now we can take this conversation and turn this conversation into a partnership and then turn this partnership into actionable items that can now, uh, that we can roll out into the community. We will take any help that we can because we want to get to, to, uh, to 80% to get to herd immunity. And now I'm hearing that they say 85% because of the Delta variant. Uh, when we came in, we, we didn't have any guidance. We didn't know what the number was. So we, we said 70% uh, and we, were, we will fully open up the, re, uh, the economy. And then as the evidence came in, because we're normally guided by the CDC and Public Health England. So Public Health England came back and said, we think you'd get herd immunity at 80%. So even though we had already promised the, the public that we'll fully open the economy at 70%, we now know that 80% uh, is, the, is the new, is the new uh, benchmark. And as of today, because of the doctor is saying that it's 85%, so we now have to relook at that. So to, to answer your question, I would think, keep the conversation going and, and reach out to us. Anyone who's listening to this, if you think you can help, I would love to hear from you. Definitely look for that. And with our ultimate parting thoughts, Dr. Hotez, I know you have to run, but uh, give us some inspiration or a challenge <laughs> as we look ahead. We have well, a lot thanks of- Thanks so much for uh, having me. It was a great discussion, very meaningful. You know, um, we, we've got to close the gap, right? So we've got, at least on the US side, we've got to vaccinate a quarter of the US population. And now we can't screw around and wait. And unfortunately, now we're going to start seeing a lot of, we're going to pay dearly as we'll see a lot of adolescents, maybe even younger kids and young people go into pediatric ICUs and other ICUs. I think some of that will be auto-correcting. I think when there's enough parents start hearing about um, young people and kids going into hospitals from COVID, they'll get it. And, and will, there will be some auto-correction. Vaccination rates will go up, but that will only take us so far as well. And and so the only two other levers we have is to counter the anti-vaccine aggression by doing something definitive with these anti-vaccine groups, um, whether it's deplatforming them or uh, trying to trying to limit the damage that they're doing, or and and not mutually exclusive, we're going to have to expand mandates. Um, uh, we're already hearing the mayor of New York wants to require. Uh, vaccines for restaurants and going to the gym and we may see more of that um, also doing something about school mandates for vaccines um, nobody wants to do it and everyone's trying like heck to avoid it but you know that that may be what's required as well you're muted you're muted sienna Thank you. <laughs> I'm still, I still forget to press the unmute button a year and a half later. But uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hotez, uh, Deputy. Thank Premier. you very much. Thank you for a great uh, discussion. Thank you. I know you have to sign off. Um, Doug, bye -bye. And, uh, we really appreciate everybody's time today. Um, I think we have a lot to, to, to do. Um, and there's a lot of great ideas that have come out of this. I think we have about 10 other conversations that could be born out of the comments that were made this afternoon. Um, Drake, do you have some final words? I think uh, the Honorable Sanders said it um, said it properly, right? Like, you know, this is the conversation that needs to happen uh, in order for us to to move that forward, especially with the community and, and government partnerships. And that's uh, that might be the key, right? That's been missing to uh, to get that eighty five percent. So, absolutely. Well, we thank everybody that's been on today and stayed with us for the hour. Um, a recording will be available. We'll share that with all the, the registrants. We're really looking forward, as I said, to continuing the conversation. This conversation only expands um, as we get into the school year, get into children's vaccinations and all the other topics that we hit upon today. So thank you so much and uh, wish everybody a safe rest of day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.